Okay, we're going live, so don't say anything nasty about somebody you don't want the whole world to hear. Of course, they probably wouldn't hear you anyhow. And we know for sure the whole world's not watching, so... Remember, you can go to akroncrc.net and get a liturgy. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning and welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. I have a few announcements to make and I hope I can remember them all. First, we're going to vote about the elder nominees, I mean the deacon nominees, and to keep Chuck for six more months as an elder. And then Leah will draw names. Second, uh, Larry is going to do children and worship, and we're going to start doing that, hope, well, nearly every Sunday. Every Sunday we can get around to it. Uh, this would be happening downstairs, and she's going to move through the year the way she would downstairs. And so the story that you'll hear today is the story that she would begin with in the fall with the kids. For most of you adults, you've never really seen this especially not the whole year's worth of stories. Third, I should have started with this one. All you people out in YouTube land, you can find the liturgy at akroncrc.net. And then you go to the meditation page, and there's a PDF or a Word document version. You can download it and print it or just read it off the computer. That way you can participate in the worship with us a little better. Fourth, I have juice and I have bread up front. If you need that for communion, just come up and get it when we have it. And fifth, welcome Betsy. There, that was number five, Betsy arrived. Okay, let us now begin our worship of God. Glory and honor, honor and glory to the all-holy trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Blessed be God the Father, the Pantocrator. Blessed be his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Amen. Amen. One is the Holy Father, one is the Holy Son, one is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God forever. Amen. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise God, all you peoples, for God's mercy is confirmed upon us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Amen. And God said, Let us make people in our image to be like ourselves. They will be masters over all life. So God created people in God's own image. God patterned them after God's self. Male and female, God created them, and God blessed them. Now and forever. 
Let us prepare to hear the word of the Lord by turning to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We carry much of the grime of the day into our worship of you, dear Lord. We're so polluted that it's difficult to hear your voice, difficult to feel your loving presence, difficult to settle into your gentle peace. Come to us now with your holy ruach blowing through our hearts and minds, clinging, cleansing us of the clinging residue of life. Come to us now and open us to your voice so we may live your word. Come to us now, administering your balm so our wounds may be healed and ourselves may be made whole. Amen. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning is of Revelations, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had, appear had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that, shook like an emerald and that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, Seven lambs were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. 
In the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four, four living creatures had six wings and was covered in eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Matthew 6, verses 5 to 13. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, truly I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think there will be, they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the gospel of our Christ. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A couple week, weeks ago, I kept running into the Lord's Prayer, and I thought, oh, three times in a week. And I thought, well, I suppose we can preach on it until Advent. It always strikes me when, I do, when, when we read the Lord's Prayer in the Gospels is that the Catholics do it right. You know, they, they uh, offer the Lord's Prayer, and then they offer petitions, and then they finish up with the doxology that's been added by the church later. Most Protestants think that's the whole thing is the Lord's Prayer, and it's not. Just that first section of petitions is the Lord's Prayer. All of my closest neighbors are dead. Some have been dead for centuries, others for a few days. I buried three or four of them, but most I never knew. Nonetheless, I spend a fair amount of time among them talking to them, wondering about them walking through the cemetery with Hannah, reading their tombstones. We did that recently. Hannah had to come running in the house and look up one, one person on Google because they made him sound so important on the tombstone. But wondering about them. And of course, thinking about my own death and burial, perhaps somewhere on those same few acres. At night, I occasionally stand among my dead neighbors, 
watching the night sky with my telescope or binoculars. I imagine that most of these people lived lives that looked a great deal like your life, like my life. They were cared for by parents. They attended school. They worked. They suffered. They rejoiced. They cried. They laughed. But now they're gone. And most are forgotten. Some died very young, infants. Some died in 1918 in the flu epidemic. Some died very old. The most difficult ones to contemplate are the teenagers. The ones who died just as they were blooming. There's one I visit, Abby. We used to watch her mother come twice a day to talk to her. Not so often anymore, though. Frequently, my mind turns towards God when I visit my neighbors. I wonder, what does it mean to leave this life? I wonder, are my neighbors right now with God? Have they been reunited with beloved family members? In the presence of God? If, if so, are they also reunited with detested family members and friends? People commonly like to think that old earthly love is remembered and continued in the presence of God. Are old earthly wounds continued as well? Or are they healed? Or forgotten? I find comfort thinking about God maintaining relationship even with my dead neighbors or with us even after we die. It seems to me that God isn't only present and active in this world. God is also active in whatever is on the other side of life because no matter how you cut it, this really can't be all that there is. But I also find comfort in trusting that God is good and gracious and loving and faithful. It allows me to let go of any fear about what happens after this. Since we're able to embrace that God is our loving father or, or our loving mother or our loving parent, it doesn't matter what image you contemplate, they're all metaphors. Since we believe that God loves us and since God is greater than the cosmos itself, we're able to rest in the trust that whatever God does or doesn't do will be the loving and just and right thing to do. We don't have to worry about heaven or hell because we know that God is gracious and compassionate forever and ever, and ever, and ever. Scripture really doesn't give us much information about heaven, as you know. I think because really there aren't any words that can encompass it. The mystery, the mystery is too great about what life is like that close to God. And we're too bound by this world. Our imaginations can't really get off the ground most of the time. 
So the details about heaven aren't all that important to us. However, the one thing that we know about heaven is what Jesus himself teaches us. Heaven is where our loving, gracious, compassionate, parental God is. Jesus teaches us that heaven and God go hand in hand. When the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray, he gives them this opening statement of faith. He teaches them to begin all their prayers with their Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, begin your prayer by proclaiming who we're addressing, our Father who is in heaven. Begin your prayer by proclaiming that you're reaching out towards the one who was and is and is to come before any of us was or is or is or was to come. And then following that faith statement, make petitions to this heavenly father or this heavenly mother or heavenly parent. Make petitions to that powerful heavenly love. And that's how Jesus teaches us to pray. That's how Jesus teaches us to pray. Jesus. Therefore, if we lose sight of Jesus, if we no longer accept Jesus as God's intimate Son, we also lose the certainty of our faith reflecting prayer. Our Father who is in heaven. If we abandon the Lord Jesus, we begin the process of abandoning our relationship with God. And if we abandon the Lord Jesus, eventually God simply becomes a deistic abstraction of no great consequence in our life. So, really, every time we pray, we should somehow profess who we're addressing. Somehow. It doesn't really have to to exactly be these words. But our, our beings need some expression that acknowledges that God is God and that God loves us and that God is always waiting for us to turn towards our Father. The first petition, then, that we offer to our loving God is, Hallowed be your name. And that simply means, may your name be made holy, or be holy. Or, your name, may your name be sacred. But we wonder where? Where are we asking for God's name to be hallowed? In heaven? No, that can't be. It's already holy there. Wherever God is truly known to be God, to be, to be God's holiness is obvious. Heaven is obviously holy because God is present. So where are we praying for God's name to be holy? Hallowed be your name. Well, we may rightfully construct this prayer as, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. In fact, the first three petitions should be constructed that way. 
Have our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. And so I'd say we're praying for the Father's name to be hallowed in our own lives. Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be holy in my own life, just as it is in heaven. This prayer that Jesus gives us actually contains then an ancient idea that one's truest identity is discovered in one's truest name. The first petition is a reference to that old image of Moses in front of the burning bush. You all remember that story. Moses sees a bush on fire in the wilderness, but it doesn't burn up, and so he walks over to check it out. And God calls to him from within the bush, Hey, Moses! Moses! And Moses says, I'm here. And God says to Moses, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. And at this, Moses hides his face because he's afraid of God. Which, you know, makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Uh, I think we'd all hide our face in the circumstance. Or actually, truthfully, let's be honest, we'd all run. It makes perfect sense after all. Moses doesn't yet know who this God is who's speaking to him from the burning bush. Moses has been raised among the gods of Egypt. Not this God. And none of them have talked to him before from a burning bush. Moses only knows that he's terrified. Something supernatural is going on here. And it's while Moses is trembling in the desert that God reveals God's deepest identity. This is one of the most important texts in all of Scripture. God says, Go and tell the people, I will be whomever I want to be has sent you. Or I will be what I will be. I am who I am is what you've all heard of it. It could be translated a number of ways. But that's one of the most important passages in Scripture because it reveals who the Lord God is. And all of that is to be conjured up when we pray, Hallowed be your name. However, importantly, however, importantly, we begin our prayer with the idea that the frightening I will be what I will be God is also the Father who loves us. Moses doesn't know that, but we do. We do not need to hide our face out of fear the way Moses did. We may open our arms and welcome this loving God whose reach extends even to the other side of the grave. There's a part of me that looks forward to lying in that graveyard with my neighbors. Because part of me really wants to move closer to the I am. Now I don't think of heaven as the bonus round you get when you die. It's, it's not that. It's not death insurance or something so crassly say. My imagination is caught up with Isaiah's vision of the throne of God. All of those creatures, all of those creatures, you guys. I mean, can you imagine them? Don't they sound fabulous? I want to see them swarm the throne of God from all over the cosmos. Not just from Earth, 
and from every other planet all over the cosmos and from every other cosmos that's ever existed. I'm anxious to see their bodies and faces and to hear their voices and their languages and I want to hear all the sounds that will be there, sounds that are completely foreign to our ears. And yet we know right there at the center is the bloody lamb who is standing next to the Father God with the gentle ruah blowing all through the heavens. There's something absolutely magnificent and attractive about these images. That's what we wait for. That's what we wait for. That's what we long for. But it all begins now with the words, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be holy in my life as it is right now in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our prayer, let us pray. Our prayer this morning is a psalm that's been written by Linda Barrett. <laughs> let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Praise the Lord. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. His back robed in meadows of vibrant green. His head crowned by the radiant sun. In his hands a river. His scepter. And sitting throned on the towering mountain. His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. Does he nudge the dawn's first light into the sky? Does blotting out the darkness of night? Does he guide the lightning and coax the thunder, flinging rain from billowing clouds? His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. Does he run with the antelopes and dance with the dolphins? Does he feed the cattle on a thousand hills? His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. Does he glide with the eagle, wings held steady, seeing all is well? Does he comfort the robin held in the hawk's talons, breathing its last in the hawk's embrace? His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is king, but the peoples tremble. Does he stroke the flames engulfing the forest, belching out smoke and crackling with rage, does he wake the volcano and heat up the lava, shaking the earth with the force of the blast? His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. Does he feast at the wedding, enjoying the party? Does he play in the orchestra or sing in the choir? Does he heal with the doctor and build with the carpenter? Does he sow with the seamstress and plow with the farmer? His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. Does he mourn at the funeral, shaking with grief? Does he sit with the dying or walk with the homeless? Does he hold the homeless man brandishing cardboard and weep with the mother who can't feed her children? His steadfast love endures forever. 
The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. His back robed in silks of mocking purple, his head crowned with crackling thorns, in his hands iron nails, his scepter. And hanging throned on a towering cross, his steadfast love endures forever. Praise the Lord. Merciful God, may your spirit sweep across our nation as we move towards this election. Give comfort to those among us suffering because of death, Lorraine and Jim Johnson, Karen Wise and Amy Quillen, the Wybinga family, and Leon Carruthers. Protect our students, our teachers, our administrators. Build courage and safety for our nurses, our business people, our families as they contemplate navigating the holidays. And we offer before your throne this week, Lisa and Bob Hassenjaeger, Nicole and Sam Herbert Hale, Sandra and Richard Height, and Ed Hoskins. Be powerfully present with these people this week and with all those with whom we worship you. In your Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, at this point, we're going to vote. So it's a yay, it's a voice vote, yay or nay, on two issues. The first is accepting the slate of deacons of Jin, Ginger Swanson, Ger, Jennifer Owen Height, and John Amadeo to replace Mike Kessel and Martha Blackford. And the second vote is yay or nay about keeping Chuck as the elder for six more months. Okay? So, let me ask you. We'll start with the first one. Do you accept the slate of Jennifer Olin Hitt, Ginger Swansinger, and John Amadeo uh, for deacons? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. Okay, that passes. The second one. Uh, do you accept Chuck King as an elder for six more months, or would you like us to go and find someone else right now? Which has absolutely nothing to do with Chuck. It has to do with process, whether or not the process is acceptable. All those who support that say aye. Aye. All who oppose it say nay. Okay, so they pass. Now Leah, come on up here. I got going from camera. <laughs> How old are you, Leah? I'm 16, so I'm going to be 17 in like four days. You're going to be 17 in four days. How many years have you been doing this? Um, Probably about 20. <laughs> <laughs> so draw two names. Okay. There's one. Ginger. Ginger Swansinger. Uh, Jennifer. Jennifer Olin Hitt. Make sure, read that one to make sure that Debbie didn't mess up. No. no. It says no. So. It says John Amadeo. So. so Jennifer and Swan and Jennifer and Ginger, thank you, honey, will be your new deacons. I have absolutely no idea how we install or dismiss, but we'll figure it out. Now, Laurie is going to do a children a worship story, then we'll do communion, and then we'll go home. Oh, not that.
there was someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people began to follow him. But they didn't know who he was. So one day, they simply had to ask. And he said, I am the light. Let's enjoy the light. People who love the light can become one with the light. This is how your light became one with the light. Watch. Juanita, this is your light. Debbie, this is your light. Look how the light is growing. It all comes from the light here. Carmaine, this is your light. Jim, this is your light. Chrissy, this is your light. See, the light is in so many places at once. Nancy, this is your light. Many have come to the light, and yet the light to receive their light, and yet the light is not smaller. I wonder how that can be, that so much light can be given away, and the light is still the same. You do it. Brian, this is your light. There was even a day when I received my light and became one with the light. <coughs> Let's enjoy the light. There comes a time when the light is changed, so it's not just in one place anymore. It can be in many places at the same time. I'm going to change the light now, so it's not just in one place, but it can be in many places. So everywhere in this room, watch, see? Now I will change each of your lights so they are not just in one place, but they can be in many places. Even the light was changed. The light that was in one place at one time now can be in all places at all times.
So it's everywhere in this room and even in other places. Please rise for the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. On the night Jesus was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this now to remember me. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the same love. After the supper, the Lord also took the cup. And said, this cup is the new covenant. Sealed by my blood. Whatever you drink it, do this to remember me. The cup that we drink in is our participation in the blood of Christ. The Lord has prepared his table for the world. Everyone who is led by the Spirit of God to the table of the Lord is invited to come with gladness. Lord, we are not worthy that you should come under our roof to be us, but to speak the word only, and our souls shall be healed. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the gifts of God for the people of God. If you need juice or bread, come up here. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. I can't wait until we can come back and stand in a circle and actually do it the way we're supposed to. This is 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, blessed be God the Father, the Pater Christ. Amen. Blessed be the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Amen. Amen. One is the Holy Father, one is the Holy Son, one is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Lord God forever. Amen. Go now in the peace of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. We miss you greatly.